Hello, welcome to the Delicious Legacy Podcast. With me, your host, Tom Dinas. Another week, another archaeogastronomical adventure. Good husband and housewife, now chiefly be glad. Things handsome to have as they ought to be had. They both do provide against Christmas do come. To welcome the neighbor, good cheer to have some. Good bread and good drink, a good fire in the hall, brown pudding and sous, and good mustard withal. Beef, mutton and pork, shred pies of the best, pig, veal, goose and capon, and turkey well dressed. Cheese, apples and nuts, jolly carols to hear. As then in the country is counted good cheer. What cost to good husband is any of this? Good household provision only it is. O father, the like I do live out a many, that costeth the husbandman never a penny. This is from Thomas Tasser, 500 points of good husbandry, 1557. One of the many household manuals and um, gardening manuals and books that um, sort of thrived in the Tudor era. On this episode, we will explore the foods of Tudor England, a time period that saw a lot of upheavals, revolutions and evolutions, and also brought in contact Europe with Americas. And of course, we had introduction of many, many new foods into our diet. I've avoided uh, the Tudor period uh, for so long because I feel as a... Um, As a period has been overrepresented in uh, historical uh, podcasts, documentaries, series, and so on and so on and so on. So yeah, it's been um, it's been a while in my mind that I would do something about Tudor England, but I kind of uh, try to steer away from it um, as much as I could until I found a reason to do at least one episode about Tudor food. We all know, of course, about Tudor England, a few things. We know about Henry VIII and his six wives, and we know about Elizabeth I and her golden era. So in a sense, uh, Tudor period starts 1485 with Henry VII and goes up to 1603 with the death of Elizabeth uh, I. So yeah, we all know about this stuff, and um, we've heard uh, countless times about Henry VIII and his six wives and so on and the reformation and uh, the dissolution of monasteries and so on and so on and so on. So, when the opportunity arose to have Brigitte Webster on the podcast as my guest, I thought, great, let's bring her in and she can talk to us about Tudor food, but also she can tell us all about her new book, Eating with the Tudors, Food and Recipes which was released this year uh, at the end of July. So we connected online and we had a fascinating discussion for about an hour about her book, how it's been structured with uh, the recipes and um, the social history of um, England and the way people ate and what was the connection with uh, the past and uh, how that changed slowly through the years in, of uh, the Tudor period coming to a more scientific and more um, enlightened uh, era later on. And of course, it's very fascinating to find out um, that uh, diet and nutrition played an important role in the food and in the eating habits of um, the people. It was equally important as today, but they had a different system, of course. They were still on the humoral theory of uh, Galen, the ancient Greek uh, who lived in Rome, around the first century AD. So it was a system about 1,500 years old and it was highly complex and of course all dependent on who you were and your constitution and your health and if you're male, female and so on. And it was very important. People really paid attention to that. Plus, you also had to eat seasonal because food, certain food was available in certain seasons. And on top of that, you had all the Lent and all the fasting periods the religion, the religious periods of fasting before Easter, every Wednesday and Friday, before Christmas, the Advent, and so on. Brigitte's um, book is based on a lot of these old uh, manuscripts and manuals and cookbooks and um, basically instructions about gardening and food in the era. And um, 
she managed to bring the food to our table with instructions, both uh, the original instructions and recipes and ingredients, and of course a modern translation that does justice to the food of the Tudors. So it was a highly complex and highly fascinating um, history. And uh, let's go and join uh, Brigitte to tell us all about it. Hello, Brigitte. Good morning. Hello, Thomas. How very nice to talk to you. Very nice to talk to you indeed. Welcome to the Delicious Legacy podcast. It's such a pleasure to have you. Oh, thank you very much. (laughs) I'm actually delighted and I'm quite excited to be a guest to your podcast because the name in itself, The Delicious Legacy, is very intriguing to any food historian. So I'm delighted to be here and to have some chat about Tudor food. Yeah, we'll definitely have a lot to say about that. I cannot take credit for the name by myself. I think my wife uh, helped a lot with it. So yeah, (laughs) (laughs) it was a joint effort. Um, Yeah, um, basically we've been um, chatting on Twitter for ages, I think, since I created the account. So since I think 2019, I believe. Uh, But um, so I know a bit of your background and everything. But how about telling us a little bit about yourself and your experience, how did it all come together and you started uh, cooking um, Tudor food, if you can, for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I am actually a qualified teacher of history, cookery and home economics, which makes me, in many ways, the perfect Tudor housewife in the 21st century England. And as you might be able to hear from my accent, I was born and educated in Austria and came to England in 1989 when I very quickly became fascinated by English history. And who isn't? (laughs) I have always liked learning new skills. And so I gained years worth of experience by taking classes in all sorts of things like furniture restoration, upholstery, you name it. And that motivated me to scour the country for reasonably priced 16th century pieces of furniture in need of restoration. And so over, well, a good two decades really, the house and the garden started to look and feel like a Tudor home. And as I'm particularly interested in social history and having lived in Tudor homes for so many years, I also started to experiment with the Tudor's way of life by recreating Tudor food and then also by default growing the plants of that period. And and that's really when the idea of inviting people to experience Tudor life was born. And um, the latest news on that front is that I've now finally also started an MA at university to study early modern history simply to enhance the academic side of my long journey into Tudor history. All right. Great. Fantastic. And um, you've been um, living um, in a like a Tudor house, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, yes, yes. We, we've always liked historic houses, but like everybody else, we started, you know, with a very small property. But... In nineteen, uh, in twenty nineteen, so just shortly before COVID brought life to a hold, my husband and I bought a very small Tudor manor here in Norfolk, which was built by Sir Edward Chamberlain in the fifteen hundreds. It is far from perfect in that it needs 
lots of work. It, it does need lots of maintenance. So it's a bit of a yeah financial drain. But we felt it gave us the perfect stage to do what we like best, and that's bringing history closer to people, and in particular Tudor history. And uh, I remember during lockdown, our first project together here was to create a Tudor kitchen garden from scratch. So I looked into the 16th century advice by Tudor garden experts uh, like Hill and uh, William Turner and William Lawson and, and even Thomas Tasser, because they describe very well in details how the perfect Tudor kitchen garden should like, what plants you should plant, how you should go, go about it, how you protect those plants. And so, yeah, I had lots of time to study that in detail. And I put basically what I'd learned into my project. And now I have a beautiful, very authentically created Tudor uh, vegetable garden. And I am growing all sorts of herbs. But here we need to clarify that the Tudors term herbs included vegetables. So when the Tudor person talks about herbs, they also mean all sorts of uh, vegetables like uh, cabbage, kale, um, Swiss, Swiss chard, uh, which was also sometimes um, referred to beet, onions, garlic, faffa beans, skirit, salsify, uh, what else have I got? Carrots, turnip, parsnip, gourd, cucumber, uh, lettuce, and here we're talking about chicory type and lamb's le lettuce. And then obviously there's also leek, pumpkin, which the Elizabethan referred to as pompions. And I have to say I prefer pompions <laughs> over pumpkin. There's also some kidney beans, maris, peas, radish, spinach, and, you know, the usual herbs as we understand them, like parsley, uh, thyme, sage, rosemary, basil, and then perhaps lesser known savory and good king Henry, chervil, and those uh, types of herbs. This is brilliant. Yeah, and specifically, specifically to Norfolk, it was also important to me that I reflect the area we're in. And yeah. uh, I found that um, Alexander's and Sapphire were really well used in this area simply because we are fairly close to the sea. And I wanted to reflect that in my garden as well. Yeah. But perhaps somewhere else these did not grow. Mm -hmm. That's This is brilliant. This is a very extensive list of uh, herbs. Vegetables mm -hmm. as well, obviously, uh, which uh, yeah, it makes it makes me a little bit jealous because I would love to have my own <laughs> such a oh, uh, big uh, a lot of, garden. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work though. Trust me, especially when it's fairly warm and fairly wet, the weeds take over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I love it too. Mm. So, um, so obviously. We have a lot of extensive records for from from the Tudor period since you said uh, you can grow all this stuff and you have the manuals from the era basically, right? Yeah. So we have okay, that's that's great because going backwards like a few hundred years before that, I guess uh, our records um, get uh, scarcer and sparser and sparser, right? We don't have much uh, record, but with Tudors, it seems we have a few things happening, a few books and so on. I guess. Technology advanced a little bit. The, the book is more common. So have more information about the Tudors? Yes, exactly. I mean, the uh, arrival of uh, the printing press in the late 1400s made a huge difference to what records we still have access to. 
And the, the Tudors in, in the 16th century, therefore, hugely benefited from this new invention. And, and you can see that reflected in the fact that books like recipe books become a lot more common. Uh, they were geared in particular at wealthy housewives. And again, you definitely notice this trend in the late 16th century. But um, even uh, how to create gardens, how to look after your orchard, all of these books were geared at the wealthy people living in England because still farmers couldn't afford that. So it, it was funny enough, something geared at the upper middle class, a class that was almost non-existent earlier, but with the printing press, with the economy stabilizing, and uh, with the fact that in Tudor England, you start a period of general peace, people are beginning to settle down. They are having more money available to spend on their home, on gardens, rather than fighting each other as in the 15th century. And you can see that clearly. And therefore, there is so much more evidence available to us today to look into what did the Tudors grow in their gardens, how they advise you to go about it. And yeah, it's hugely interesting. And uh, a lot of uh, those sources are available online. And um, that's why I included them all in my book. So other people, if they are encouraged by my findings, go and look for some themselves. But the one I, uh, uh, the ones I have used mostly for the creation of the vegetable garden, which then supplies me exactly the vegetables in season to recreate my recipes, were well, mostly uh, by William Harrison, John Stowe, uh, John Gerard. Uh, William Turner, Thomas Hill, and William Lawson. So those are mostly the ones I've used for my book in order to make sure I'm growing the right vegetables and fruit. And obviously, there are lots of cookery books that I used, but they all had to be written in English, and they all had to be written and published between 1485 and 1603. So that was my criteria for the recipes. That's brilliant. Yeah. Talking about books of the Tudor England, the reason we are here today discussing is because you've released a book as well about Tudor food. So how about telling us a tiny bit about it? What is it called? Uh, and um, give us some, some stuff about it. Right. Yeah. The book is called Eating with the Tudors. And it is clearly designed to encourage the recreation of authentic to the recipes following the seasons. But I would like to stress that it's not just a cookery book. Yeah, absolutely. That's I, that's clear yeah, from, uh, I, from if somebody reads the book. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot more than just a cookery book. <laughs> I, I have also aimed for the book to act as a sort of reference guide for all things Tudor food. And to me, it was important to portray the eating habits of all levels in society, uh, not just royalty. Obviously, we, we know a lot about what people at the top eight, but it was more the commoners that I wanted the reader to understand what they ate, the, the importance of food to people of all walks of life in Tudor England. And so I have included very detailed sections on the history of food, on meals, their ingredients, the recipes, and also restrictions. 
And also, the, the general attitude to food in the 16th century here in England, because it actually had changed so much between its beginning in 1485 and its end in 1603. And it was also important to me that um, every recipe featured a picture because <laughs> the titles of some of, of the recipes can be very misleading and the picture just helps you yeah. identify what sort of dish you're creating. Most people probably compare the original and my modern take and can tell, but I just felt having a, a picture to accompany every single recipe would help. Definitely, definitely. And that's what I did. Yeah, uh, we'll come to the recipes in a little bit. But um, obviously we're talking about Tudor period in England and you defined the, the end and the beginning. And we need to say that it's very important important and pivotal moment in time because we have the the, the, the travels in the new world uh, from Europeans going and bringing back a lot of uh, ingredients yeah. and uh, we also have uh, a lot of technologies developing and um, uh, more interaction uh, with, uh, with the far corners of the world so there is a lot of more new ingredients and scientific discoveries as well which change the way uh, people eat and people uh, think about health and food uh, and um, how you eat. So, for example, you talk a lot about uh, the four humors, the Gallen's, Gallen's uh, theory of four humors. And it, that's something um, I talked a lot about in the podcast in various episodes because it was very prominent in Europe throughout, from the ancient world up until <laughs> Tudor time, right? Yeah, that's true. And to me, it's also interesting that because that system of the humours was a sort of invented by Galen, who lived in Rome, he focused on all the food that he knew, which grew in warmer climates. But it then created a lot of problems to people in Northern Europe to hope with the humours he had awarded to people and the food because it wasn't just humans that had uh, four uh, humours. Every single item of food was given humours. And uh, to me, it's interesting that uh, a lot of it, you can tell that it was all done in Italy. And when you then try and adapt it to English standards, the English climate, it just really doesn't work very well. <laughs> and that was even made harder when we start seeing new food, exotic food, arrive from the Americas. Because the physicians, Tudor physicians, found it very easy to obviously adopt the turkey. Yeah. Because the turkey, they based on all the other poultry, so they knew which humours to award turkey. And it was a fabulous new introduction. People took it by storm. But other items, like the potato, the sweet potato in particular, they weren't quite so sure because there wasn't much they could compare it to. And that's in particular a problem for the tomato. Now, we do know that the tomato, which came from probably the region around Mexico and was introduced to Europe by the Spaniards, we do know that it had arrived in Europe in the 16th century, but because there was nothing they could compare it to, they were very reluctant to adopt it. I think in Southern Europe, they were a lot quicker at it than in England. The English were traditionally very suspect of anything new. And so even that we know that they had seen or at least knew about the tomatoes, for instance, or, or uh, the uh, maize, 
it took another few hundred years for them to embrace them in their cooking. And, and that I find fascinating yeah. that it all sort of goes back to the humours. Yeah, I was going to say nothing changes here. The English has been <laughs> reluctant <laughs> to try something new, but yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> so, yeah, so... Obviously, you, in your book, you talk about a lot about um, humors, and you explain a lot of of stuff uh, in great detail, which is fantastic for the reader. So that's fantastic. But also, then uh, you categorize the, the the recipes in the book, obviously according to the season, which is a very logical thing to my mind to do, especially with a book talking about historical food, because people ate what was seasonal. If you would like to tell us a couple of things about what was. In each season, do you have some um, some like static starting point of what was um, eaten in spring, summer, autumn, winter? Right. Uh, well, obviously, the Tudors were totally in tune with what was in season because they had no other means to preserve food but to put them in salt, pack them in salt, dry them, uh, smoke them, and later using sugar or brine. So they had to be very clued up on which food was in season, which is sadly a skill we have totally lost because food is available you know every day every week every month you go to the supermarket and you are able to buy food that's out of season because it's been imported from somewhere in the world where it does grow in that particular season so that was my idea why i listed my recipes according to season to help the readers re-identify the seasons and what was in season. And in spring, obviously, uh, well, every season also has its religious holidays, which again asked or restricted food by first the church and later economic um, problems. But I, I therefore tie in those holidays to explain how that worked. Now, in spring, you obviously have just come out of winter, so fresh food is scarce. Uh, in the garden, you would have vegetables like leek, any root vegetable that survived underneath the soil, like carrots. You would also have parsnip, skirrets uh, do tend to survive well. And then obviously you have cabbage <laughs> if you were able to protect them from rabbits mm -hmm. and or birds. So there were various things you could find out in your garden, but uh, it's mostly items like eggs, grain, flour, cheese that the Tudors would eat in the spring. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and, and the recipes do reflect that very much. So for in the early spring, you have all the recipes for pancakes and for fritters and um, making use of new flowers that uh, started like elderflower. I love elderflower. So ah, okay. I, I definitely recommend to try some elderflower recipes from the book. And you can see by following the recipes, you can see how the climate then got warmer and how the Tudors then already in spring had to think about the autumn because summer and autumn was not just about enjoying fresh produce from the garden and the orchard. It was also about preparing for winter mm. because in winter, especially for people living in towns, it was the harshest season. People in the country, uh, even the poor people in the country, they could go foraging. Right. Almost everybody had a little bit of patch of land attached to the hovel where they could just grow some very basic root vegetables. But in towns, people didn't even have kitchens. Poor people living in towns didn't even have 
the facility to cook something for themselves. They mm. were entirely dependent on fast food. Yeah, we, we you could call it fast food. They had to go and buy their food from food stalls, which interestingly were open 24 hours a day, every day, because these people had nowhere else to buy and prepare food. Right. Clearly, the quality was not very good. Uh, there was a lot of dubious meat being sold, uh, hidden in pies. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they didn't have a good reputation at all. But at least it was where people could buy a warm meal. I find it very interesting that uh, they had something like takeaways in two days in the end. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's something that um, is not very well known, I suppose, uh, to to us, to common <laughs> to common people out there who, yeah, we, we try to we don't know about history and we try to learn a bit more about it. And what is also very interesting is, uh, you know, talking with so many food historians over the past few years. It's also interesting that uh, we, well, not we, but you mainly uh, as historians, you are kind of moving away from what just the elite ate and done, but also what the common people and the other classes had. Uh, so people trying to investigate about about the common people, what they ate, how they ate, what was their everyday life, which is very interesting to me. And I think that, that part of the social history of food is, is very appealing to me as well. And um, yeah, I'm very interested to know more about the common people in the Tudor era, I suppose, which is yeah. ma- it makes your book very interesting anyway. I'll be back after this short break. So, talking about... Um, Common people's food. So obviously, uh, the commoners and the people who, who, the poorer people, ate a lot of vegetables. I would guess, and uh, they followed a lot of their religious uh, fasts uh, and the Lent throughout the year. So they would eat a lot of vegetables like um, cabbage and skirret and salsify. Which skirret and salsify are root vegetables, right? Which are not very common nowadays. They fell out of fashion. Yes, they both are. Yes, I've been experimenting with both, and by doing so, discovered that salsify thrives really well in normal soil, and it's actually quite attractive too. So I love having it in my vegetable garden. It makes the whole thing look beautiful in the summer. But skirrets, I discovered, really prefer barely wet soil. Otherwise, their root just doesn't develop properly, which means you've got nothing to eat. So I had to remove them out of my vegetable garden and replanted them next to my moat where they are doing really well. But you see, this is what is so exciting about experimental Mm. food and plant history you learn as you go and i'm sure the tutors didn't have to do that they just knew but i have to learn but the the, the thing is that um, in tudor england even the poor people knew how to actually look after themselves uh in fact we do not have any period where people starved to death Only in the 1590s were there once a few years where that was an issue. But generally, even the poor people looked after themselves. And they were often able to keep a few chickens. A lot were able to keep a pig. A pig, therefore, was ideal because... It was dedicated food. You know, you didn't need to keep it all year round to get get milk or something. It was a dedicated meat source, Mm. and it didn't cost you anything to keep a pig. It would uh, uh, provide you with lots of young ones in the spring, and then you let them eat uh, in, in the forest, and, you know, you give them any food leftovers. So they were ideal for poor people. Um, hence, a lot of the meat from pork was used by poorer people. 
the good parts they sold and got some cash for it, the better bits like the lard, the fat, they kept for themselves. And the same goes for chickens. Mm. With chickens, they were able to get eggs and meat If they were a little bit better off, if they were a tenant farmer, which were basically poor people, they could also keep a cow. And the cow or an ox would provide them either with um, milk for the cow or as an ox, as a tool to plow your fields. So they were able to actually do something about their food uh, supply. Again, as we said before, it was really the poor people in town, in urban surroundings that were a little bit more stuck and dependent on other people to help out. Yeah, yeah, that's an important distinction to make. Uh, But um, I guess at the time, the urban population was uh, a lot smaller compared to the population who lived in the countryside. So most people lived um, in the countryside, right? Am I correct in thinking that? Um, Yes, yes, that's true. But like today, there was a certain magnet to towns, people Mm. who weren't tenant farmers, who were not employed as servants to richer people, often thought that the town was or the city was the place where they could find employment. And in many ways... It is a growing problem in Tudor England because you do get an explosion of the population. All of a sudden, in 16th century, people do live longer. There are more people who survive, hence because no war and so on. But it has also, as everything else, consequences. So What happens is you have a growing middle class. Mm. Merchants, for instance, shoot out of nowhere. They become very wealthy, but they are not tied down by the rules of the aristocracy, which looked after the people in need. See, the merchants have the money, but they haven't got that code of how to look after other people who were below their status. So they don't employ lots of people in their service. They try and do everything on the cheap. And that has the consequence in that people in the countryside not necessarily find employment and are therefore forced to go and try their luck in the city. Mm. So it's a little bit like a a vicious circle, if you like. Life gets better and improves for many, but again, only in a certain class. And in Tudor England, it was the middle class, the middling people who all of a sudden improved their life, but people at the very bottom missed out on it, Mm. as so often. Yeah, that's so often is the case. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely right. Talking, uh, yeah, going back to food, I suppose, and uh, your experience all these years with cooking um, Tudor food, what would you say are the most uh, interesting experiments that you've done with the food? What have you found? You talked about, obviously, about eating seasonal and the knowledge of growing their own food. In terms of uh, cooking per se, what what would you find uh, interesting? What skills and what uh, kind of... um, I guess this is would be standing out for you. When I started to recreate to the recipes, I quickly discovered that so-called modernized recipes that you found in other books often varied considerably from the original version, mm-hmm. which in the eyes of a food historian was therefore no longer authentic. Mm -hmm. The quirky nature and character of the original Tudor recipes was therefore often missed because of its modern spelling and also the addition of 21st century measurements and ingredients. Mm -hmm. I, I actually remember how disappointed 
I was when I first realized that what I believed was a Tudor recipe was indeed a mere 21st century take on the original instruction. And to me, that was my turning point. That's when I set myself on a mission. <laughs> I wanted to cook real Tudor food and analyze its taste and the preparation. And then I quickly realized <laughs> that authentic recipes were available, but in order to comprehend them, I needed to equip myself with further skills yet. And step one was to take classes in how to read early handwriting. Mm. Uh, I took classes in paleography and social history because without it, I would not have been able to decipher th these early manuscripts. And so I quickly learned that Tudor recipes are, unlike the modern, extremely detailed step-by-step -step guides, like, you know, you open a modern uh, recipe book and it really tells you every single step. Well, Tudor recipes are different. Um, they are just a kind of aid memoir written by cooks for other cooks. Mm -hmm. uh, cooks who were extremely competent in cooking and they really didn't need any instructions how to fulfill the very basic steps. But the rest, in the, they often miss out ingredients and major steps, but the rest uh, of such a recipe assumed you knew anyway, mm. hence whole chunks of vital information often are missing. And recipes, to the recipes, lacking also vital information on not just the ingredients, but also certain cooking steps, definitely measurements and cooking times. Right. And to be able to fill in, in those gaps, you do need to know a certain certain cooking practices, a, a very basic understanding of food science and and how to 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 prepare food so that's what i had to do and yeah that's why i included in my cookery book the original as well as the modern infill so people can at least compare the yeah, two yeah. they can see how i jumped from one assumption to the next Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. No, it's, it's very fascinating. And um, I mean, from um, reading and trying to find as, ma as many recipes or cookbooks from the past myself, I mean, I think that was prominent and, and always the case in every recipe of the past. There was always assuming that it was from one cook to another cook. So a lot of uh, the details and the measurements were always missing. And I think that's a very key difference with modern cookbooks, which I guess that started developing from the industrial age onwards, right? All these details. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. And uh, in terms of um, favorite dishes, let's say, uh, from from all these recipes that you cooked, what which ones stand out or which ones uh, you find them tastiest? Like if you have mm. one, or, or one or two that you can uh, uh, <laughs> tell us about. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I would say it depends on the season, but I I do always I absolutely love all fruit pies. Right. I think to the fruit pies just are so much better than their modern versions. But I also like there's one recipe a bean pottage with bacon. I really love that one Ooh, because that good. it reflects how the less well off dined and that it actually was quite tasty mm. you could produce tasty food even if you had little money and i think yeah i suppose i also like fritters i'm a bit of a fritters fan yeah <laughs> <laughs> great fantastic 
Sounds good to me. Uh, like a, a nice uh, round meal. We have our starter with fritters. We have our menu with uh, the bean, <laughs> the bean stew with bacon, and we have our dessert with fruit pies. Great. <laughs> Uh, sounds fantastic the fruit pies by the way so we're talking about uh, uh, plums and damsons and um, apples and pears and um, what what uh, other fruits w- uh, were in, available in the Tudor orchard my favorite one is quince yeah quince definitely uh, ticks all the boxes for me it's a fruit you can't uh, consume raw you have to mm. cook it but when you cook it it uh, releases the most lovely fragrance. Your whole house takes on this exceptionally nice uh, smell of quince. Um, it also has a lovely color, but what I I just love uh, the taste of it. It's just mm. you can't describe it. It's second to okay. none. Um, and another fruit I quite like to work with because it's a very Tudor and in in some way has completely uh, lost its place in modern society is the medlar yes absolutely yeah <laughs> the medlar unfortunately is very tedious to work with mm. a very interesting again very different from anything you know but it has a very distinctive flavor which i personally love i mm. think it's fantastic but it's probably a little bit like a marmite fruit right you love it you hate it <laughs> i see i see obviously medlar you're saying that it was popular back then it was it was a fruit that it was um very common yes 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 um yeah, yeah definitely you don't find medlars very often you can find medlar jelly uh, in some places but not uh, much else about medlar uh, but I think one of our friends, our common friends, uh, Neil Butter, had an all, a whole episode about uh, meddlers and um, meddler growing and all that stuff. Um, so I think if um, uh, <laughs> our listeners want to hear more about meddler, they can uh, find um, Neil Butter's episode on the British food history and yours as well, because you went to Neil's podcast to, to talk about uh, Tudor food. Well, I think it's... Um, Time to slowly wrap up our conversation. Obviously, uh, thank you so much for all this information, your time. I have a couple of um, more questions, I suppose. W- how can we actually link uh, the Tudor food to what was before the Tudor era? And um, how can we find common um, elements with um, modern cuisine? Is there anything, do you think, that uh, links today with the Tudor era or that's a um, completely different alien world? Uh, no, no, not at all. Uh, one example that comes to mind is food being given as a gift, as a token of appreciation. Um, if we look at today's world, we still give a box of chocolate. We still make a cake Um, or even for Christmas, uh, the Christmas hamper. Yeah. And if you go back in history, food was always given by everybody to everybody. Sometimes you had to be careful which food you gave to whom, because obviously hierarchy had strict rules on what gift was appropriate for whom and Mm. by whom. But that, I think, is one of the key elements that connects us with the past, Mm -hmm. that how we see food as something worthy of giving to somebody else. Fantastic. That sounds great. Um point to finish our conversation here and um, tell um, our listeners again, remind our listeners again, please, about your book. What is it called and uh, where they can find it? It's called Eating with the Tudors and it is published by Pen and Sword Books. It is available directly from the publisher, but also on um, Amazon and there are various food outlets or historic houses that have started stocking my book as well. 
which is lovely to see because I think these are the places where I personally would love to see my book. This is brilliant. Yeah. Can you tell us which ones? Do you have? Do you remember? Or do you, do you, can you tell us? Yes, um, I have seen it at Hokum um, Hall in Norfolk because I used some of their original manuscripts. So I think they thought it would good would be good to have a book that reflects them. But I know that it's also on display at the Mary Rose at Museum, and uh, the Shakespeare uh, birthplace has it. So, yeah, those are a few I remember quickly, but yeah. Brilliant. That sounds good. Hopefully a growing list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. It's a fantastic book, and I think everybody who's interested in food and history should uh, have it. And um, th this, yeah, there's a, it's a treasure trove of information about the Tudor period. Um, and uh, what's your, what are your plans for the future? Do you have... Um, Another book coming up? Yeah, I'm currently writing on my next book, which is uh, about Tudor gardens, uh, Tudor kitchen gardens, the fashion of how to create a Tudor garden. Yes, and again, it's very much based on my own personal journey to recreating Tudor gardens to uh, a standard that can be regarded as much authentic as possible. That's great. Looking forward to it. Brigitte, thank you so much for coming on the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a real joy, real fun. So lovely. Thank you. Great. Thank you, listeners. And uh, remember, if you want to get Brigitte's book, just go to Pen and Sword website and order from there or from any other online retailer or bookstore you find. Thanks for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. If you enjoy the podcast, please help uh, with the running costs and go to Patreon. And from $3 a month, you can become a member and get the podcasts early and ad free, plus hundreds of different recipes and musings and articles um, for free. I will put in the show notes the links of uh, Brigitte's book and also what, um, where else you can find her. That's all for now. Thank you and goodbye.